Amen. Good morning, you guys. How we doing? Hey, I got, I got an Easter surprise for you. Do you want to hear it? I, no, I, that was not good enough. I'm, I'm still, I'm not going to give it to you now. I literally prayed and fasted for this for you guys, and that's all I got. So I won't give it to you today. Um, yeah, I'm not even joking. Um, but good morning. Uh, I, will, I, I think I'll put a video on Facebook to get you to follow us on Facebook this week. So um, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I don't know. I don't know. Hey, my name's John Maroos, and I've got an Easter surprise that you guys just lost. No, I'm kidding. Stop it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Good to see you. My name is John Roos. I'm the lead pastor, and we do have a sweet Sunday. It's been a packed house uh, all day today. Very excited to see you guys. Go to Matthew 5 in your Bible or your iPad or your iPhone. We got Bibles up here. Um, I was kind of lethargic at the first two services. I'm feeling peppy right now. I'm ready, man. I'm, brother, I'm ready right now. But we got ESV Bibles. That's what I teach you out of down here. We've got German Bibles for my German friends in the house today uh, as well. But we'll also throw all this up behind me. So if none of this makes sense, I'll do my best to make it easy uh, if you have no clue what the Bible's even about. But we'll be in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We are in a great series. Uh, week 2, we're calling it Apprentice. We're calling it Apprentice. And uh, it's born out of a very serious topic. It's born out of this idea of so many precious people in this church coming to me and coming to the pastors and saying, I'm ready to find victory over and then fill in the blank. I mean, that's why we're here. We're not just here to, to do a religious thing. We're here to be touched by God. We're here to be changed by God. And this idea that the soul, wherever, wherever that even exists, but it's the engine that drives us, that the soul can literally be changed inside of us is, is an addicting and a staggering idea. Um, things like anxiety, things like uh, fear. Uh, things like anger and hate and uh, unforgiveness and all those things, they can be changed inside of us. And that's really who we are designed to be, but it's who we want to be. And the question that remains is, how do we get there? How do we get there? And that's where apprentice, the concept of apprentice, is born into this series. So to experience Christ, guys, to experience Jesus Christ, not for him to be this, this idea, but to actually experience him in this world on Monday and Tuesday and to be changed by Christ. Man, what do you need? Think about that. Like, what, what would you love to add to yourself? You know, less materialism, more faith, you know, more love, maybe a marriage to come together. Maybe when you look in the mirror, just peace in your minds. To experience Christ and to be changed by Christ, you must become an apprentice of Christ. You must be an apprentice of Christ. I believe in supernatural miracles. Amen? Amen? Come on now. Help me preach this. I believe in supernatural miracles. I believe a 13-year-old can be struggling with an identity issue at school and can be so touched by the Spirit and know the love of God in a single experience that they can walk into school like a lion on Monday. I believe that. I believe a marriage, like... One's on that side of the room, the other's on that side of the room, but you're in church, right? You made it through the uprights. That's all I'm going to do with the Super Bowl this Sunday. You made, it, you made it through. You'll get that tomorrow. I believe that marriage can be supernaturally brought back together by an experience of the Holy Spirit, but the primary way in the Bible that God changes a human soul is through this thing we call apprenticeship. And that is learning the ways of Jesus. Learning, look up here, learning the ways of Jesus and then practicing the ways of Jesus. Here's why, here's how, here's how it works. When we learn a way of Jesus, let's say forgiveness or let's say faith or selflessness from the Bible or who we are as Christians, identity, when we hear these things from the word of Jesus and then we take an active step to practice it, that's where we're missing it. When we take an active step to practice it, that's when the soul shifts. But I think oftentimes in churches, I'm not, I'm not here to insult anybody, in churches, it's a little bit like the Super Bowl. Okay, I did it again. I said I, that was my last time, but there's number two. We, we kind of come in as spectators and we're like, hey, look at the quarterback guy up there. And we hear something, we go away and we're like, yeah, that was good. 
But what if we could actually start taking what we hear and saying, together, we're going we're gonna to work this out tonight. Like, as soon as we leave here, we're going we're gonna to look for ways to start taking steps out into this teaching. That is when the, the Holy Spirit will begin to actually shift and remake your soul. Guys, that's huge. What is the possibility of you now? This is real. If you're new with us, if you're not a Jesus follower, let me show you how real it is. Um, I was an atheist for 20 years. That's crazy. I mean, in many ways. I, I was a drunk. I was a, I was, I was a brawler. Um, on my way to play Major League Baseball, because that's how all good Major League Baseball players live, right? That, that was my life. I was, I was a shell of a man. I was a shell of me. But outwardly, everyone was looking at me and saying, oh, look at him and all this stuff. I was dead inside until I had a collision with Jesus Christ and the gospel. And I came to him for saving faith. And his spirit came upon me. And his words started making sense to me. And I started taking these steps out. And I'm like, oh, dang, I can't punch that guy anymore. I got to go talk to that guy now. And I would like take that step out or anxiety or depression, loneliness. Jesus would, would, would speak to me and it'd be like very uncomfortable. And sometimes I didn't want to hear it. But in faith, I would step out and go, okay, here we go. I'm going to do this thing. And I would step out and my soul would shift a little more. This is real stuff, guys. This is real stuff. And so each week we're going to take a teaching of Jesus and we're, gonna, we're not just going to hear it. We're going to leave here and we're going to practice it, guys. We're going to take steps and put it in action. And today where we're going to start, and you can write this down and take a picture of it, I want to talk about the master's way for relationships. The master's way for relationships. Everyone's relationships are good here, right? We're good? You're good? Everyone's good? Yeah. This is why we're starting here. Because the most beautiful thing in the world is a relationship. I, I was that tough kid who didn't need anybody, and I, was, I ran solo and all this stuff. But I realized, looking back now especially, I realized the sweetest places in my life are my relationships. And I don't just mean like the fluffy, like, I get to like skip down the street with my wife. We, we skip down the street together, actually. But what I mean is, even my brothers who got my back, I mean, thick as thieves stuff, you know, there's something about having people who you're connected with. We are made for this. It enlarges the soul. It does so much for us. But um, I want to ask you, who taught you how to have relationships? Who taught me? You know? And, and not even so much how to get into a relationship. But my, my, my focus today is, who taught you how to deal with relationships when they go sideways? For me, it was in Living Color. Remember that show? That's why we need to become apprentices of Jesus and sit at his feet <laughs> and hear what he says about these things. And that's what we're going to do in Matthew chapter 5. But let me say it uh, quickly again, guys. I want you to really get this. I'll say this uh, most weeks. Following Jesus, being transformed by Jesus, is progressively replacing destructive thoughts with the thoughts from the mind of Jesus. Okay, I'm doing it this way and it sucks. This is killing me. It's not working. And I got I to gotta, I gotta get out of this hole somehow. This hole's dangerous. I got I to gotta get out of this. And you go like this. What does he say about this? What does he want me to do with this? And you take his mind and you take those words and you put it into your mind and you go, oh, my soul. That's like, that's like going 80 on the Autobahn and putting it in reverse right there. And then you take a step out. That, that is the transformation process of God, of God. How many of you guys have ever remodeled like a house? I don't know what just happened. I think John just likes to yell. John, give me another manly yell. Yeah, see? That's John. He's, he's up here in our band. I love this guy. Well, if you've ever remodeled a house, remodeling takes longer than you want. Amen? It's more painful than you stink and want. Amen? Especially if you're trying to live in the house while doing the remodel. But that's what's going on in us. We are living in the house and we're doing the remodel. So grace upon grace. We do this together. We do this patiently. We do this one teaching at a time, one week at a time. So we're going to look at what's called the Sermon on the Mount. Everyone say Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> I always tell the 10 o'clock, the 1130 is the rowdy crowd. So I, I just want some energy out of you guys, all right? 
Um, this is a beautiful sermon that Jesus preaches in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. We're going to stay in it for a while. And in this sermon, he's got like 8,000 points. And he hits like every life topic. And he literally says this over and over, guys. And I remember my, my wife said to me this week, she goes, this is what changed my life, John. When you, when you taught this from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus goes like this. He looks out over this vast crowd and he goes, you have heard that it was said. <laughs> and they were wrong. I say to you, oh man, like this, he lays down the gauntlet. And who's in the crowd? The religious leaders. He goes, you heard them say, I say to you, you heard them say that sex is about this. I say, money, I say, vocation, I say, identity, I say. Like he goes through like almost life at bullet speed. And we're going to take every one of those teachings. And the world has said, do it this way. And Jesus is going to tell us through this Sermon on the Mount as well. I say to you, I say to you. So Matthew chapter 5, we're going to sit at the feet of this young visionary leader with little education as he sits down in the posture of a rabbi in front of a crowd of thousands and begins to re literally reteach a fresh way of going forward into this broken world, a fresh way of being human. And what's amazing in this sermon is Christ wastes no time going to relationships. Why do you think that is? Because while they're the be most beautiful things in the world, they are the hardest things in the world. And I would say if your relationships are off, it has a tendency to throw much else in life off. I know when I'm arguing my, with my wife, when she's being a pain and she's wrong, you know how that is. Uh, my wife's in here this service. She's supposed to be back there in the kids' ministry. Uh, no, I'm kidding, honey. I love you. Uh, but I know when my relationship with her is off, I know my, my worship is off. I know... Um, how I deal with my spending is off. I, I, everything goes off when, when relationships go off. So I'm not so concerned with, with, again, teaching you today in the next few minutes how to go into a relationship. And I'm not even talking about uh, marriage or anything like that. I'm talking about human relationships. I, I want to teach you the art of recovery because that's where we get screwed up. I remember when my wife and I got married, I remember telling her, we are always going to fight and she was like so disappointed. And I, I kind of would be too if my husband said that. <laughs> and now I want that to gradually reduce as we grow in Jesus Christ. That should happen. But as two human beings locked together in beauty, but also the flesh and all this stuff, we are going to have collisions, right? Um, with my friends and the people that uh, work, uh, work under me and all of that, we are going to have collisions. You're never going to avoid the collisions. But what if you could master the recovery Someone write that down and tweet that bad boy. What if you could master the recovery? Because my wife will tell you, she's right back here. We have grown in our love towards each other by mastering recovery more than avoiding the collision. Love has opened up grace and gentleness and all these new things. So I'm going to show you this. Write this one point down. Take a picture of this. I want to show you the master's way for relationships is forgiveness. Forgiveness. Oh, if we could just get forgiveness, if we could just get forgiveness, it is the foundation to the house. We want the frame, we want the shingles, we want the drywall and the sheetrock, we want to put the carpet in, but if we could just get the foundation, which is forgiveness, because a relationship is a lot of beautiful things, but it's also a collision of two sinners. Matthew 5.1, here's the setting. I need you to take a trip. I need you to go in your mind's eye back to the first century in the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's 12.04 in the afternoon. The sun's out. That's how you know you're no longer in Germany. <laughs> you know I love this country. But I want you to, I want you to go there in your mind's eye. You're, you're on the Sea of Galilee. It's a massive body of water. You've been following Jesus for a long time. There he is. You've been close to him. You feel like you know him. You, you, you know he knows you. 
but there's still this aura about him that's so special. And, and you're following close behind him as he's walking on the beach of the, of the lake. And, and you look behind you, and there are literally thousands of people picking up speed, and they want to touch Jesus. They want to ask Jesus about their marriages and, and the finances and the government and all this stuff. And, and as a follower of Jesus who's been with him for a while now, you're acting as a little bit of a bodyguard, you know, and a little kid will try to squeeze through your legs, and you'll push him back, and, and you're keeping all these people at bay. Hold on! He doesn't, you know, and, and so what he does is he actually spins on his heels, and he begins to walk up this hill. Many of you have been there on this hill, and he begins to walk up this craggy hill, not so much a mountain, and then he spins around, and he sits down, and he takes the posture of a rabbi, and he tells you to sit down with the other followers, and he begins to teach you about life. It is called the way in the Bible. He wants to teach you the way to live. Matthew 5, 1. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. That's you. Just put yourself there. You've got a robe on now. You've got Birkenstocks. You're rep representing Germany. And you have your legs crossed. You know that every word he speaks gives life. But you've been with him a while, hear me now, and there he goes again, another sermon, you know. You've heard this one, it sounds familiar, you wonder if he's recycling sermons now. And because you know this introduction, maybe you doze a bit, maybe if your robe has a pocket, you pull your phone out, and you begin to, during the sermon, look up things on your phone, and you're tired, you're thinking about what's going to happen in that afternoon. When all of a sudden you hear from the voice of the Lord in the middle of this sermon, and how are your relationships? And, and you perk up because you, you know that's a place you need help with. You know, you put your phone back in your robe and, and you lean in a little bit, and all of a sudden the most awkward thing happens. You look over and in the crowd you see that person that you're not doing so well with. They're not supposed to be here. This is for Jesus followers, not them. And they lock eyes with you, you know, one of those really awkward moments. Man, you just lean in and you think, yeah, I need to figure out this, this relationship thing, this forgiveness thing. Let me ask you a couple questions and we're going to dive into Matthew 5, verses 21 to 24. How do we deal with people who fail us? How do we deal with people? Sometimes we do it well. Uh, sometimes we screw it up. But how do we deal with people who fail us? How do, we, how do we deal with people who miss our mark? Isn't it funny that we have marks? Um, I, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, my master, and, uh, and, and he's the bar, and yet I have this bar for people. You know how crazy that is, you guys? Like, you missed my mark. And Jesus goes like this, I have no mark for you, John. You live in grace. And I've got this mark, this bar for people. But I was asking myself that, like, John, how do you deal with people who go against your will? Because obviously your will is sovereign. <laughs> no, it's not. And is this impacting our relationships? And, and I don't think this destroys uh, things like maybe an adulterous affair or abuse. Um, that's a different sermon, by the way. That's not what I'm speaking about today. That's a whole other sermon. But I believe as many relationships get destroyed by death by 10,000 paper cuts, just a lot of little things that happen, little glances, little things that are said, and it gets between friends, it gets between coworkers, um, it gets between wives and husbands, definitely. But I think it's the little things that fester in the heart that Jesus is so passionate to remove because he loves us, he loves relationships, and he died to create them. So, look at Matthew 5, 21. Uh, before I even read that verse, this is going to be a good verse. Before I even go there, um, I was just, I got to confess my sins uh, to you. Is this a safe place? We're not recording this, right? Okay, good. Um, so, let me tell you, it's the little things, guys. If maybe you're here and you have a relationship that's strained. I don't know what happened. I want to be respectful and, and love you. But think about this. I wonder if it's a, you know, it's like a, um, it's like, oh, so my sink in my, in my, uh, my little German house that I absolutely love. 
I, we turned it on one, one day, and it shoots out like four jet streams now. It's like, pfft, which I thought was kind of cool, but my wife didn't like it. Well, mineral deposits got in there, and it got clogged. Now, that happened over time. It took a long time for those mineral deposits to get clogged and, and to make the spray all screwy and weird. And I think that's what happens in the heart. It's an accumulation of a lot of little things that begins to get us off. It begins to like, you know, and make the relationship feel weird. And, and what happens is when one little thing uh, happens between two people, oftentimes we begin to kind of replay that moment over and over. Is anybody with me? We're like bad movie directors. All my movies are rated R for ridiculous. <laughs> and I replay these scenes over and over, and then they can be the smallest scenes, the smallest scenes. They really can be. But I let them fester, and, and every time I'm like, cut, it was worse than that. <laughs> Do it again, replay it. Cut, come on now, that hurt, you know. Um, and it's like we almost, human beings are almost built with a scoreboard in their hearts, you know. And it's like, well, you're up now, one nothing. Huh, and I'm gonna, I gotta, I gotta tie the game. And I still got some time. And uh, my wife scored this week. She scored on me. I think it was Wednesday or Thursday. Maybe it was Friday, Jess. I, I was very sick this week. And um, like on my deathbed sick. And I, <laughs> I, okay, maybe I'm being dramatic. But uh, I played it up so I could get some free food. And so my wife brought me in a bowl of soup. And... Uh, my stomach was on edge, and she brought me in this bowl of soup. First of all, the bowl was way too hot, guys, and I'm sick. I don't deserve that. <laughs> now, don't look at her. Side with me. Don't. Come on. Side with me. And so she, the bowl's too hot, and I'm like, I don't have patience right now for this. And then I eat it, and I'm like, you know, and I'm like, this, there's way too much spice in this, Jessica. And you know, she should have dumped that on my lap is what she should have done. <laughs> But what was weird is I was just sick and dumb and cranky. And so she's like, she's sweet. So she's like, okay, no worries. And she takes it out. And I went to sleep and I woke up. And for some reason, I was still edgy. I was still like this, like, you know. And I realized it wasn't because I was sick. It was because I was still allowing something that small to fester. And four hours later, I, I was still looking at my wife. And there was still this animosity from one little thing. Jesus' message to us as apprentices, if we really want to follow him, is we have got to learn how to get that out, okay? So look at Matthew 5, 21. Here's the teaching. This is really fun and good stuff. Are you guys good? I always feel like you're, okay, I feel like you get tight when I talk about forgiveness and stuff. I just want to make sure you're loose. Matthew 5, 21, here's what he said. He's talking about relationships gone wrong here. He goes, you have heard that it was said to those of old. So, for years and years, this has been the tradition. You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Now, he's talking about when someone offends you. Not like in a vicious way. Here's what, here's what the rabbis are teaching in Jesus' day and, and many years before. And it got into the minds of the people, and it was screwing their relations up, relationships up. Hey, if someone offends you, um, you, can be, you can be angry at them. You can, you can be bitter. You can actually speak ill of them. You can be cynical towards them. Just don't kill them. Just don't kill them. As long as you don't kill them, you're good. And that's an easy, that's easy. Like, I, so I can hate you. I can, be mad, I can be mad at my wife still today, like this morning over soup, and I can be like, yeah, that woman. As long as I don't, you don't kill her, Jesus said, and we're good. <laughs> and, and what was happening is because Jesus is not, He's not just, God is not just looking on the outward. He's not just like, oh, you're, you're a pretty little dressed up thing over there. He is, the Bible says he's the one who searches the hearts. He's interested in the emotions and the heart, the mind, the love, the purity of conscience. He goes like this, I don't care if you don't kill her. I need you to love her. I need you to clear your heart towards her. I died so you guys could be one. Like, no, I'm not, I'm not cool if you guys walk into church together and, and you, don't, you, know, you haven't done anything physical to her. I'm concerned if you got bad emotions towards her. I want those cleaned out because that relationship has been empowered to be something beautiful. Clean it out, John. I don't care if you don't kill her. I mean, don't. 
That, they, they were, that's why religion is dangerous and tricky. And if you're here and you're religious, I want to introduce you to Christ who wants the hearts. When things go sideways in a relationship, this teaching of as long as you don't kill that person, you're fine, Jesus intercepts that and he goes, you have heard that. Here's what I say. What is going on inside you? That's what I'm after. Look at Matthew 5, 20. What a powerful, powerful verse this is. For I tell you, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the religious people, you will never enter heaven. In other words, it's not enough just to play it up on the outside. A true child of God is one who's being transformed on the inside. So, and it doesn't mean we always do it. That's why we are here. Um, I screwed it up. It doesn't mean we always do it. But what Jesus is saying is like, we're, we're not trying to be these like, Religious people who are just like, well, I didn't kill her, but I kind of hate her, and we're stuck together. You know, I told her I love her when we got married. If anything changes, you know, I'll let her know. No, he's like, no, I didn't save you for that. My spirit is changing you on the inside. You should do everything you can to get the emotions out and bridge that gap and have a true powerful love again for her. And that goes for uh, if you're a boss over soldiers. I mean, it does not matter. It means towards people, our neighbors. Do, do we have things in our hearts towards people? And which, which tells me this is an ongoing process because I'm just constantly screwing this up and constantly getting it out. Praise God for his grace. Amen. Look at Matthew 5, 22. He says, but I say to you, oh, I love it when Jesus comes in like that. You, you heard them say this. I don't know if he said that. I say to you, man, there's so much power in his voice. Here's what I'm saying. Because what, what is about to be unpacked gives life every time. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to the judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Now, what is Jesus saying? If you're here and you're a Christian, if you've ever called someone an idiot, you're going to hell. No, he's not saying that. Praise God, we'd be in trouble. He is saying that when we don't clean out the heart towards people and we hold these, this animosity, this frustration towards people, we are not aligning with our standing in Christ as saved people. We are aligning with our old life of being lost and undone. He says, I want your heart to match your standing with me. You're saved. You're a child of God. You've got new abilities and new powers to love and forgive and to care and encourage and heal. Go do it. Go do it. Follow me. And like I did with soup, <laughs> I should have never told you guys that. When you treat someone beyond their offense, and that really what it was, it was like I was lucky the girl loves me and brought me soup. But sometimes we can treat someone beyond their offense. And what Jesus is saying is that just doesn't match the heart of a believer who's being soaked in grace by God, who's being soaked in forgiveness, who's experiencing love from God. How can you receive that and not give it out? Well, praise God, the Bible says he remembers that we are but dust because we do forget. And, uh, you know, I... I wrote down this week, anger is a gateway sin. Like, you know, they used to say marijuana is a gateway drug. They used to say that. Um, anger is a gateway sin. If you read the New Testament correctly, it says, Paul says, put away anger and malice and bitterness. All these things are the things that come through anger. Division, you know, all these vicious, vicious words. It all starts with a small sliver of anger. And all anger is not wrong. All anger is not wrong. Um, but I will reserve my anger for those who God says it is reserved for. And I will reserve my anger for that which God says it's reserved for, but not the people who I call friends, coworker, loved ones. It's not the will of God's. Look at Matthew 5, 23. So what's the remedy? There's no nuances here. There's no, well, my, my situation, this and that. And again, we're not talking about like very, 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 very bad things that have happened to people. We're not. That's a different sermon, guys. 
But I'm talking about these bumps and these rubs and disappointments in people and teens being frustrated with parents and parents just, ah, this teenager. Verse 23, so if you are offering, here's the remedy, here's the, here's the move. If you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift, leave it right there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Now here's what he's talking about. The once a year, five day walk to the temple in Jerusalem with your family and a sheep to go sacrifice it in, in the temple with the high priest, the Passover. He's talking about the Passover. Now, this is crazy because you walk five days, you know, all dirty. You're losing money because you're not working. You got your family. Your kids are crying. All this stuff is happening. And you get there. You wait in this huge line. There'd be a huge line coming out of the temple. Blood's running down. All these animals are in line. And, and you're just like, you're handing the animal to the high priest. And Hannah, next person, you're just like, it's like Ikea in a really bloody way. <laughs> it's like, is this ever going to end? I ever, I'm, I'm feeling faint, you know. And uh, you get there. This is what Jesus is saying. You get there. It, you're next. And you hand the sheep to the high priest. And all of a sudden, it hits you. Oh, my soul. That person I work with. My wife. My mom back home. Get out of line that you stood in eight hours walk five days back home and before you sacrifice anything to me I love you and that relationship so much that I died for it just go make it right and this is not a true statement this is Jesus exaggerating he is trying to get the point across that he loves your relationships this much he has infused in your relationships the joy of life he has embedded them in there. There's nothing like being unified with someone and, and laughing with someone and doing things with someone and, and, and just having that, that fellowship. He has, he has hidden so much in that relationship that he is saying your priority is to go make sure there's nothing between you and that person. Well, why so extreme, Jesus? Maybe you're even kind of going, eh, maybe. Maybe. Well, let me give you a couple motivators. If God has brought some into your mind already, you can accomplish a ton in life, guys. You can accomplish a ton in life, but without the human connection, we will always be a shell of ourselves. I would rather give away all the accomplishments and, and have these beautiful relationships with people any day of the, the world, week or whatever, because those accomplishments are not going to save my neck. They're not going to be there when things get crazy. But all the accomplishments are eventually going to go away, and I'm going to need people. I'm going to need my crew, my brothers, my wife, my family around me. And it's worth not letting these things fester, but just saying, hey, can I talk to you? I'm sorry. I'm not even sure I said forgive me for the soup thing, Jessica. Forgive me for the soup thing. It's not worth anything festering. And sometimes we get people that come up and they say, how? How do, you, how do you stay on fire for God, John? Like, you're crazy. And, like, how do you stay like this? And I'm like, I don't know. A lot of coffee and stuff. But, but one of the encouragements I want to throw out just for you to pray through, not to accuse you or condemn you, is that your relationship with God is directly connected to your relationship with people. I mean, this thing is just one fluid motion. When he saves you and, and this thing is healed, these things are designed to get healed. And when, when we're supposed to be experiencing this and this thing's broken, it can't go back up very easily. It doesn't mean God walks away from you. It doesn't mean God, isn't, God is angry with you or casting you aside. No, 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 no. It means your worship is off. And so maybe, maybe for some, I don't know, maybe today is the day just to let, let, let that thing out of the heart and come back to worshiping God. I sat my family down and we were just hanging out talking and uh, I said to them, you know, you're, you're limited by many things. I'm limited by many things, by ability and opportunity. I, I just, I'm limited. You're limited. But none of us are limited with forgiveness. None of us. 
Not one of us. We have an infinite capacity to forgive. It's scary sometimes because we feel like it's letting someone off the hook. Again, that's another sermon. But we have the infinite ability to release people from a hostage situation of them not hitting our bar every second. As a matter of fact, I'm just going to admit this to you guys today while I'm confessing my sins in front of you. I'm going to, I'm going to confess to you that it is harder for me. It takes more energy. It takes more labor to not forgive someone than to actually forgive them because I have the spirit of Jesus Christ. And he's, he's messing with me all the time. He's like, you know this love. You know what Jesus did for you. You know what you did to so-and-so. You know what you did to God, and he loves you the same. It is actually, because of the Holy Spirit, harder to not forgive. It's like I'm, I dig my heels in, you know, and I'm like, no. And Jesus just goes like this. Do you want, do you want to experience my life? Then follow me. Um, forgiveness is almost a cuss word in the church. You know, every, every time you say, hey, we're going to do a, a series on forgiveness, everyone's kind of like, yeah. <laughs> I am not coming with my husband during that series. You know. <laughs> but um, I want to repair that. I'm going to get choked up. <laughs> because forgiveness maybe the most extraordinary experience of our lives. It is beautiful. And yet when we know we got to do it, we look at it as something almost dirty. Instead of saying, oh my soul, this move that I'm about to make is so powerful and beautiful. What do I mean? When you, when you reconcile with someone, when you forgive or you are forgiven, it opens so much of the soul. New places of love and humility. I've learned how to be so much more humble by screwing up and going to my wife or my friends and being like, man, I need to talk to you. I, I screwed up here. That's a man right there. The old John was not a man who just thought, I don't do that stuff, man. I don't care. That's not a man. A man is a guy who can be rock-ribbed and strong, but who can also go like this, man, I need to open new places of humility in my life right now and be a balanced man and go to that person. New love happens. New trust happens when someone goes, wow, you knew you did that and you came to me and you said that? Like, I trust you more now. We're tighter now. Forgiveness is a beautiful thing, and I want us to start reworking how we see forgiveness. I mean, think about it, guys. Even our relationship with God began with what? Forgiveness. Not law. Not performance. Like this beautiful world opened when he said, I forgive you. <laughs> it's amazing grace. Can't wait to screw up and hurt my wife and, and ask for forgiveness now. <laughs> it's a beautiful move, guys. And so if you need some motivation today, because I know sometimes we do, we just need a supernatural jarring. I want you to see Jesus on the cross, hanging there for us, loving us, forgiving us. And if we can't experience that and move that out towards someone else, let God speak to you through the cross. See him hanging there. But I want to ask you a question. Will you take this teaching and will you follow him this week? Will you follow him? I'm going to ask the band to slide up. We're going to move right into communion. And communion is going to be our way of response. A way to respond to this teaching of Jesus. And I want you just to stay in a posture of worship. Don't lose your focus. Stay in a posture of worship. And we're going to eat the bread and drink the cup together, so don't outrun me here, but you can, you can begin to try to open that top layer, use your teeth, <laughs> pass a knife around, but do you try to pull back that top layer, and let me just talk to you for a minute. We are about to... move into an ancient practice that's over 2,000 years old. And when we do this, 
we will feel a move of the Holy Spirit come over us. So I want you to take that bread and just hold it in your hands. Just hold it in your hands. This ancient practice was handed down to those who are saved, to those who know Jesus as their Savior. Hold that bread in your hands. And if that's you today, I want you to celebrate. The Bible says, as you hold that bread in your hand, and he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And as we all eat at once, this bread is to remind us that we are one, yet many individual people. Jesus took a loaf of bread and broke many pieces off, reminding them, you must stay unified. As we eat together, we are declaring that we will follow Jesus in unity. Church, let's eat together. And now the cup. The Bible says, and likewise the cup after they had eaten. Jesus said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. The new covenant, the forgiveness, the reminder that we're forgiven of our sins. So if you're here and maybe you haven't done too well with your relationships. My friend, resurrection time, you are forgiven and free if you are in Christ. The cup of God's wrath is empty. Jesus consumed it all. There's not a drop left. That's what we remember. And so by God's grace, he has covered it all. We declare that now by drinking together. You know, the coolest thing happened after, after the first communion. The 12 apostles, they were going to have a really bad week. Do you know that? They had to go to the Mount of Olives, and they would screw up really badly. And Jesus knew that, and Jesus knew that they had to remember his grace and his love. And so before they went out into that very dark night, the Bible says that when they had sung a hymn first, that when they sung a song together, they went out to the Mount of Olives and they faced their week. They faced their challenges. And I can't imagine sitting in that room at two in the morning hearing God sing. But I want to hear it today. So I want to pray over us and we're, we are going to do the same. We are going to sing a song. And then we are going to go out to our Mount of Olives. Father, Father, sing to us your truth. You are the Almighty. You are God. You are the great forgiver, the great reconciler. Lord Jesus, help us to be apprentices. And I pray if you've pressed on anybody's heart today to get something right with someone this week, they would declare, I follow Jesus. Holy Spirit, I pray you would empower us now as we sing this song to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Frontline, let's stand.